raise your hand if you've had buyers that were really close to getting in contract, but you just couldn't get them to move forward or they got caught up on the price or the terms, or they're just a little hesitant or they don't trust you when you tell them you got, they got to come up 50,000 or a hundred thousand or 25,000 or whatever it might be. Right. Pretty much everyone's raised their hand. Right. So this is a big, a big issue today. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, guys, is high level buyer conversion. And the reason I think this is necessary is because we're all going through these challenges right now. Right. And these are tips and strategies and dialogue and framework for you to get buyers to move forward. And these are things that top buyer agents are using today in 2023. It's not stuff that I just made up. Um, I mastermind constantly, guys, with other high-level producers, mm -hmm. not just on our team and other in, in other on other teams and other states and stuff like that. And I'm always looking for what's working today, right? And hearing it from people who are having success today. Because what worked six months ago is not necessarily working today, right? The conversations you have to have with your clients today is different from what you were saying, you know, last year or the year before, just because the market has changed, right? So that's what this is going to be all about. We're going to go deep into what to say, how to say it, some of the thought process, some of the mindset, so that you can feel more confident in leading your clients, you know, to the finish line and moving them forward. So first thing here, guys, you see, what's the problem that we're facing in 2023? Um, number one, guys, is interest rates have gone up substantially in the last 12 months. Yes or no? Right? Making affordability a huge issue. Right. If the rates were three percent before, or four percent, or five percent, and now they're six or seven, well, to buy that same home, it's a lot more expensive. Correct. Inventory is at an all-time low because the interest rates have gone up. Inventory is low as well, right? Because if I'm a seller and I got to sell my home and then I got to go buy a new one, well, I'm going to be subject to the higher rates right now especially for people who refinanced a couple years ago and locked into a low rate at two or three or 4%. I know when I refinanced, refinanced my house a couple of years ago, I got in right at the right time. I got in at like a three and a quarter. Um, but before that, I was at like a, a high fives, low sixes for a long time. And I, you know, jumped on the refinance bandwagon and I got in right at the right time because right after that, the rates went up, right? So there's a lot of people who did that and they don't want to get rid of their good rate. So that's why inventory is also staying low. Um, although rates are higher, right? There's still a huge demand for housing because new buyers are entering the market every single day, right? People turn 35 years old every single day, right? What's the average age of people that are buying homes right now? Probably like low 30s maybe, right? So people turn that age every single day, right? People get jobs, people get married, people leave the, their, their house, they wanna buy a home. So there's always people wanting to buy, right? So the demand is still really high um, because new buyers are entering the market and there's an undersupply of home, right? The low inventory because sellers don't want to sell, but the high demand because there's new buyers always entering the market. Um, there's also uncertainty in the economy due to inflation, all the things you're hearing, right? Companies laying people off, the, the government's getting involved to try to uh, manage inflation and stuff like that. So anybody watching the news right now, it's like, you only hear bad news, right? So that's also affecting, you know, buyers confidence in, in moving forward. Um, because of all this, right? The real estate market is extremely competitive and homes are selling well over asking. They're getting multiple offers, right? It's like, we would think like if the economy is not doing so good, then the housing market would be bad, but it's actually the opposite, right? It's even though you see uncertainty in the economy, like the homes are still going over the asking price way over because there's not a lot of homes. It's just simple supply and demand in our area. Um, and what's happening guys is buyers are forced to compete, right? Think about this. If you guys are dealing with buyers, they got to compete right now, right? Uh, like they never have before. They got to stretch their budget just to have a chance at getting their offer accepted. Liliana earlier was saying that she can get a buyer in contract right now she just talked to the agent, but he has to come up a hundred thousand more dollars, right? So that's like sticker shock for a lot of people, right? Hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money for a lot of people, right? Um, and then so all of this stuff that's happening, guys, puts pressure on buyers. It puts pressure. It makes them hesitant when moving forward, right? It makes them reluctant to believe you, right? When you're just trying to relay the information, like, hey, this is what the market's doing. A lot of times they don't trust you. 
right? They think, oh, you're just trying to close the sale or whatever it might be. But really, we're just we're trying to navigate the market just like buyers and sellers are as well, right? So these are the problems we're facing. Are there any other problems, guys, that I didn't cover right here that don't all fall like in this category? Is there anything else that you see that's like a big issue that we're having right now with buyers getting into contract? Okay, great. So we're on the same page. Uh, okay. So how do we tackle this stuff, right? Like as an agent, how do you fight these problems that we have? How do you combat the problems that we have? How do we go about trying to navigate these different issues that we have? Well, number one is agents must be more skilled and they must understand the market at a high level, right? If you don't understand the market, guys, and you can't explain this to people, you're at a disadvantage. If you don't know how to talk to people and say it in ways that make sense to them, right, or break it down for them, you're at a disadvantage, right? And the agents who are having success, they're actually paying attention. They're studying the market. They're practicing this stuff. And then they're using this information when they're meeting with clients, right? So if you guys want to level up, if anybody wants to level up, whoever's here in the room or whoever's going to watch the recording, skills are a must, which is why you need to show up to training. Um, agents must be able to communicate this information to buyers in ways that they will understand it, right? You have different types of buyers, right? Some clients understand data, some it's like a foreign language, right? Some are better with stories, right? So you have to also adapt to the different clients that you're dealing with to be able to explain this information to them. Um, agents must constantly tweak their strategy so they can be more effective and keep up with the changes in the market. So if you're not constantly like studying and tweaking and getting better and perfecting your script and practicing your presentation or adjusting like what you say on your showings and stuff like that, you're gonna get left behind. It's a constant tweak, right? Um, agents must also commit to learning, practicing and implementing. So you can come to this training today. You can say, hey, that's great stuff. Enrique, it sounds really good. But then if you just walk out and you don't implement any of this, you got a disadvantage, right? You're gonna get the same results. You can't expect different results if you're not changing your approach, if you're not implementing the stuff that you're learning like in real time, right? And if you're like taking forever to start doing something that you know is working, by the time you start doing it, the market already changed on you, right? So you gotta be quick, right? You learn something today, you gotta to start saying that today on your appointments, right? That's just the bottom line. Um, so the bottom line guys is what worked before is not necessarily working today. As the market changes, you must change your approach. That's just the bottom line, right? Everyone must level up. If you're not leveling up, you're going to slowly get phased out because it's going to get it's going to get too hard to, to close deals, right? And if you can't close deals consistently, well, then you can't survive, right? You can't make money. You can't pay your bills. You can't have lifestyle. And then people start looking for other options, other jobs and stuff like that. It's just it's the bar is raising, guys. That's just the bottom line. Now. When I say that, guys, the bars, you know, it's going up. Does anybody get nervous when I say that? Is anybody nervous that it's getting harder? A little bit? It's okay, right? Like you can't, you could be nervous. But at the end of the day, you, you got to decide, right? Like, do I just be nervous and be scared or do I like do something about it? Do I step up? Do I show up to training? Do I commit to learning this stuff? Do I commit to mastering my craft? Because I promise you, if you commit to mastering your craft and you commit to getting better, when the market does get more favorable, which it will, right? The market always goes in cycles, right? I've been through many cycles in my 20-year career. When it does get more favorable, you're going to have so many skills and so much grit and so much you know, knowledge that you'll be able to capitalize, right? While other agents phased out because it was too hard, you're the ones who slowly gain market share, right? You start gaining clients you start gaining referrals, you start building your database, you just get stronger and stronger, right? You get your online presence going, all that good stuff, and you become a force in the real estate industry, right? So it's one of those things where, yeah, is it a little nerve wracking? Like, yeah, the market's tough. Yeah, that is a reality, but we got to decide how we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it as a challenge or we're going to look at it as an opportunity, right? To capitalize. And so that, that's the message I want to leave with you guys. Think about like, how do I want to look at this problem that we're facing? How do I want to look at these challenges that we're going through? That's your choice. Okay.
Feel free to ask any questions at any time, guys, but I'm gonna go through a few things. What is working today? These are tips and strategies from top agents. Um, and these are recent. I was on a mastermind this past Monday. I was on a mastermind last week. Um, I've networked with other agents recently and I'm like, what's working for you guys? What's working for you guys? What are your guys doing? What are your top guys doing, right? And so what I did is I took bits and pieces from different places and I put them all together. And I said, okay, these are the five or six things that top agents are doing right now. The ones who are consistently getting deals and contract and even looking at people on our team and outside of our team, there's like a common thread with a lot of these. So if you can do all of these strategies and like stack them on top of each other, like your game is going to be so strong, like you'll be able to convert buyers a lot faster, get them in contract a lot faster, make it make your job less stressful, right? And you can go into it with a lot more confidence as well. Okay, so this is where you're going to want to take notes. So big takeaway right here, guys. Um, to be effective and convert at a higher level, the biggest thing that you need to do right now is you need to understand your client profile. What do I mean by that? What sort of client are you dealing with, right? When I get a Zillow call and I, we do the ALM, right? We book the appointment, location, motivation, then we go show them a home. Before I go out there and show them, I need to know, is it a first time buyer? Is it someone who's already had experience, who's already made offers on properties? Someone who's sold a home before, bought a home? Is it an investor I'm working with? Right? Why do you guys think that's important? So you can tailor your approach. So you could tailor your approach. That's what Gio said, right? Is that what you were going to say, Jackie? Yeah. So you can tailor your approach. Because if I go to an appointment or meet with a client and they're an experienced buyer, and I'm over here trying to talk about the escrow process and why you got to get pre-approved and they already know this stuff. Am I going to hit it off with them? Right. Am I speaking their language? Right. If I go meet an investor who's looking to buy and flip homes or looking to buy a rental property and they're experienced investor and I'm over here saying, well, we got to do a buyer consult. We got to go through the steps of buying a home and they already own 40 homes. There's a huge disconnect right there. Right. So the top agents, guys, and I, there's a guy that I, that I um, was watching an interview. He got 10 buyers in contract in May, 10 buyers in contract. And this was the number one piece of advice that he gave. He was like, before I go out there, I need to understand what type of client am I dealing with? Because my dialogue is going to change depending on who that client is. Right. And a lot of us are not doing that. A lot of us are just saying the same song and dance for every single client. And then we're missing a lot of people right? You're not connecting with them. Or immediately they go like, you're not that good of an agent because you're not speaking my language. You're not saying something that is important to me, right? So how do we find out what their client profile is? You ask questions. So when you book the first appointment, even if it's Zillow, right? Zillow says, hey, we got to stick to the script, the ALM. You got to do the ALM. But what I would suggest for everyone is you add a little bit at the end and you find out what type of client you're dealing with so that when you're on your way to that appointment or before you go out there, you can prepare and bring the necessary information or have the script down that you're going to apply to that particular client. What's the question that you can ask? That's a universal question is the question on the bottom right here. What has your experience been so far with buying a home? Something along those lines, right? And they're going to tell you probably one of three things. Oh, you know what? This is our first time, right? And then you can ask follow-up questions. Have you guys looked at tour any homes yet, right? You can ask these questions either on the phone or you can ask these questions when you get there. And you want to collect this information before you start spitting out your value proposition, right? So if I'm at a showing, for example, and I meet this client for the first time, before I start telling them like what I do and why we're so great, Right. I'm going to introduce myself, but I'm going to say, hey, before we get started, I always just like to understand what type of client I'm dealing with so I can provide the best service. Right. What has your experience been so far with buying a home? And then I shut up and I listen. And they're going to say, oh, this is our first time. Right. We're a first time buyer. Hey, okay, great. Congratulations. First time buyer. Hey, congrats on taking this big step. Have you guys looked at any other homes yet? Have you guys submitted any offers? Right. What have you guys done so far? No, you're the first person we've talked to. This is the first time we're seeing a home ever. Okay, so then I know in my mind, 
I'm going to talk to them a certain way versus the one who's already shot for homes, who's already looked at homes with other agents, who's already submitted offers, who's already lost out on offers. There's different value to that particular client. To the first time home buyer who's never seen a home before, this is their first time ever walking into a house. What's the biggest, what's the value to that client that I can give them? Buyer consultation, right? Telling them what the market's all about, giving them a buyer consultation, informing them on the escrow process, basically walking them step by step through that whole entire process. That's going to be a huge value for a first time beginning stage buyer. Yes or no? Okay. Now let's say it's a buyer who's maybe a first time buyer, but they've already been working with another agent. They've already looked at a ton of homes. They've already submitted offers and they lost out on a bunch of offers. What's my value to that person? What would the value be to that type of person? Track record. Track record. Stories of how we've been able to get people's offer accepted. It may not necessarily be like, let's do a buyer consultation, right? Let's walk you through the escrow process. Or let me show you what writing an offer is like because they've already, they've already written offers. They've already lost. So if we're just saying the same thing and that's not really that valuable to the client, when they leave, they're not, they're not really going to be that impressed. But if I start speaking their language and saying, hey, you know what? I know, you, you know you've lost out on several offers. Here's what we're doing to win. Here's the strategies we're using to get our buyer's offers accepted, right? Here's how my team and I are able to get buyer's offers accepted a lot faster, you know, and we work with a lot of clients who are unsuccessful with other agents, and this is what we do different, and then we've been able to get their offer accepted. So you see how my language is changing from the first-time buyer who hasn't done anything versus the one who's a little bit more experienced who's already lost some battles. Okay, what if I meet with an investor? What if they're an investor and they're here to look at this home to see if it's a potential flip or a potential rental property? I'm gonna ask the same question. Hey, you're an investor, awesome. You know, what's, uh, tell me about your, your investment strategy. Hey, have you bought any homes before? Are you a new investor? Or are you an experienced investor? And then I'm gonna shut up. I want them to talk. I wanna, I wanna collect as much information so I can tailor my approach. If I'm like, hey, well, let's jump on a consultation. Let's go through the process of buying a home. And they've already bought a bunch of homes. I'm not that valuable to them. But if I'm like, hey, what's your investment strategy? What sort of return on investment are you looking for? Right? Are you looking at off-market properties only? Are you looking at long-term holes? Are you looking at flips? What sort of return are you trying to get on each one of your, rent your flips? Okay, great. We work with other investors. This is what we've been able to do. Now I'm speaking the language to that investor and he's going to say, okay, this agent knows what they're talking about. This is an agent I would want to work with. So in all those three scenarios, guys, it's a different talk track, right? And for some of us, we're just doing the basic, right? We're saying the same thing to everyone and then we're not converting these leads. We're booking the appointment, we're meeting with them and then they ghost us. They go with someone else who was speaking their language. So just doing this right here, just understanding your client profile and just knowing, is it A, B, or C? And I got to go down this lane, this lane, or this lane, depending if it's A, B, or C. I got to do a different song and dance for this particular client because, because the option A is not valuable to my investor, right? Just doing that, guys, it's going to get you a lot further with clients, right? It doesn't guarantee you're going to close, but I promise you, Less clients are going to flake on you. Less clients are going to ghost you, right? They're going to be more responsive. You're going to carry the conversations a lot further. And then obviously you got to be able to deliver on what it is that you're offering, them, right? So I'm going to stop right here. What questions do you have so far on this step right here? So at the end of this, we'll do some, we're going to role play these actual scenarios, right? So I'm going to give you guys the lesson and then we're going to spend a good chunk of time actually role playing asking these questions, right? Because it's one thing for you to learn it right here, but if you don't practice it and you can't say it confidently, then it was just a cool training that you showed up to, right? Okay. Next one, understanding your value proposition, right? And we kind of went into that right now, but what would be the value to each different buyer, right? So I'm gonna just re-say those one more time. First time home buyer, your value to a first time home buyer is walking them step-by-step step through the entire process the buyer consultation, the escrow process, right? Like some of us are saying off-market properties, but if they don't even know why off-market properties are beneficial, then it's a disconnect right there, right? 
So it's more going to be like the education, the handholding, showing them, consulting them, making sure it's a smooth process, making sure they're informed. That's the type of language that you got to use with the very early stage, first time home buyer. All right. Step B, an experienced or someone who's already put some offers in or bought or sold some homes sometime. The, the value proposition to those, like if it's a buyer that keeps getting beat out, maybe it's off market properties, right? It's like, hey, you, you guys have only been searching for properties on the MLS. We know the inventory is low. What if I find you an off market deal? I know Jackie and uh, Maudie just closed a deal that was an off market deal, right? So that's a perfect story, uh, uh, story to say. It's like, hey, totally understand what you're dealing with. We're dealing with the same thing over here with our clients, but the difference is we're going after these other pool of inventory. We're door knocking for opportunity, right? This is why I'm different than the other agent. I'm not just showing you what's on the MLS, right? So talking about how your strategies are going to help get their foot in the door, avoid competition, make it a smoother process, right? Not necessarily negotiate a better deal because right now, it's hard to negotiate a deal, right? So I wouldn't even say that unless you really know you can get them a better deal. But it's more like, hey, you've been, you're burnt out because you've been looking at so many homes and getting beat so many times. This is how we're going to change that, right? And you got to speak that type of language. The investor, it's figuring out what their investment strategy is. Asking questions like, what's your investment strategy? How experienced are you? you have contractors, right? You're trying to flip properties. Maybe you're a first time flipper. Do you have a team of contractors that you work with, right? Do you have people that are going to put the money up? Like we have connections for that, right? What sort of return on, on investment are you looking for with your flips, right? If you're looking to buy and hold, buy a property and hold it as a rental property, you know, what's important to you? What are the numbers that you got to hit? Having these types of conversations is going to be a lot more valuable than like, hey, let's jump on a buyer console and show you the steps of buying a home. Right? So you need to know, what do I say in each scenario? Okay. And it ties back into this, right? You're just adjusting your approach to fit that particular profile. Right? So the best agents, like if you were to put me in like right now to work with buyers, I'd probably get a lot further because I immediately just read the buyer and then I go down this lane or go down that lane because I've been doing it for so long, right? And I noticed that a lot of the, the top agents on our team or even on other teams, they're able to think like that and they're able to start saying language that that buyer is going to find valuable. And the agents who are new, they're just kind of doing like a general spiel, right? Like it's just a... Buyer console, right? Like, let's do that. They're not a tailoring the approach. Okay. Here's the big one, guys. When you're working with clients right now, and we know it's a competitive market, what's happening is, what I've seen is, there's a lot of agents who will show homes, they'll go out there, they'll show a bunch of homes and they'll never really talk about the data. They'll never really set the right expectations for what the market is like. I, I, they'll never really like establish from day one that you're gonna be competing with multiple offers. You're probably gonna have to come up in your price. And what they're doing is they're waiting until the buyer finds the home that they want. And then they're doing this offer console and then they're going over the data and then they're trying to get the client to come up with the crazy old price at that time, right? That's not working today, guys. Because people get sticker shock, right? And then what's going to happen is you waste all this time showing homes and you've never really prepped them for what's going to happen until the end. And then you'll see a lot of buyers pull back at that time, right? It's like that knee jerk reaction. Oh, how much do I got to pay? What? There's 22 offers, like, right? It's that sticker shock. So the best agents that I'm seeing right now is they're sharing this information early on. They're sharing the data early on. They're setting the tone early on of what it's going to be like to buy a home when they first meet the client. And they're doing it several times throughout the process of working with that client. They're not waiting till the end or not waiting till the client has found the perfect home or not waiting till the client wants to submit an offer to present this information. And here's the reason why a lot of newer agents or agents who are a little more amateur in the sales skills, here's the reason why a lot of them don't want to share that early on. Why do you guys think? 
scare, right? Everyone in the room said scare. You don't want to scare the client away. But let me ask you this. Would you rather scare them away in the beginning or do all this work and show them homes and drive all over the place and do all this stuff just to scare them away at the end? Because now whose time are you wasting? Your own. Your own. And theirs, right? If they really weren't prepared to buy a home in this market, you kind of didn't really do a service for them, right? You kind of led them on like with the song and dance and our reviews and like why we're great. And all right, well, but now this is reality. Now you got to compete with 12 offers and they're going, I need you to pay a hundred thousand more right now. Right. And some people say, well, I got to have them experience some loss first, you know, for them to like see the reality. I don't know. Like, I'd rather people not experience loss if we don't have to experience loss. I'd rather get it right the first time, right? Yeah, some people do learn from experiencing loss or losing out. And then they say, okay, this is the reality. But I think our job, our fiduciary duty as an agent, as a consultant, as, some, as an advisor, is to really set the expectations up front. Because if you set the expectations up front, they can never come back and say, well, you didn't let me know. You didn't tell me this is what it's like. I'm a first-time home buyer. I don't know crap right? All I know is what you're telling me. So I think it's our job to let these people know up front. So what I've seen some of these top agents doing and what I've discussed with them is at the very first meeting, when they go show that first home, they're bringing comps already to that first meeting. They're saying, hey, when you take a look at this home, let me show you actually what's selling in the neighborhood. These are the last three sales in the neighborhood. This is what they were listed for. This is what they ended up selling for. This is how many offers they received. You know, are you aware of what's happening in the market right now? Are you aware of what the competition is like, right? And some of them may say, yes, I am. And some of them may say, no, I didn't know it was like that, right? I just know I want to buy a home. But they're ripping the Band-Aid off right in the beginning, right? And then they're able to focus their efforts on, hey, that's the market, but this is what we're going to do to get our foot in the door. This is what we're going to do to prepare you along the way. This is what we're going to do to make sure you're informed and you're not surprised when you have to compete, right? So they're having that dialogue up front or on the buyer console, right? Maybe it's not at the first showing. If you can't do that at the first showing, but on that first meeting, if it's a console, you're spending time on the market data where you're saying, hey, what neighborhood are you looking to buy in? 95123, Blossom Valley. I know that area really, very well. Let's go ahead and pull up some of the market activity. And what I want to do is I want to make sure you, under, you understand exactly what's happening in Boston Valley. Right? This is what the inventory is like. This is how many homes there are for sale, right? This is what the homes are selling for. This is the average list price. This is the average days on market, right? And I'm saying this not to scare you, but I'm saying this to prepare you, right? But don't worry, I'm here to guide you, right? I'm going to make sure that we get our foot in the door. I'm going to make sure we get you a home. But it's important we know what we're getting ourselves into. Is that fair, Mr. Client? And then at that point, like, it's up to them if they want to play the game or not. But I think, just imagine if we did this with every client, right? We'd probably lose some, the ones that just don't want to participate in a crazy market. But the ones that you do have that stick around and they're informed, those are the, going to be the serious ones, right? Because they know what they're getting themselves into. So I would rather have four or five, like, soft. All it solid clients who like know the market, they know what they're getting themselves into. They're, they have the expectations set. And to think I have like 10 buyers that I'm working with and really five of them just aren't really serious because we waste time. We start going and showing homes to these buyers when they're trying to lowball every property. If you have buyers who are trying to lowball property, you're wasting everybody's time right now. You're wasting your own. If you're a senior agent, you're wasting your junior agent's time. You're wasting the buyer's time. You're wasting the listing agent's time. You're wasting the seller's time. If you think you're going to lowball a property that just went on the market and you're competing with offers, right? Like there is no reason to even do that. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it because I would have this conversation early on, right? And I would set the tone. So if anybody's doing that, I need you to let me know and they should be in this training today, right? Or they're going to watch the replay. So sticker shock is real, guys, right? The property's listed at $9.99. Looks like a great deal. They got offers at $1.4. It's a real sticker shock, right? $400,000 more. That's happened. Rob just had his client, what, his property that got in contract, right? What was it? Listed at 
a million, went for 1.3. So imagine those buyers who were like inquiring, wanted to see the home, thinking it was going for a million. And no one like told them like, hey, this is probably going to go for 1.3. And don't just take my word for it. Let's actually look at the data. Let me share the data with you. These, these are the comps. This is another home down the street that had an extra bedroom that was a little bit nicer, right? And then what happens is you get to the offer table and then the client's like, oh, wait a minute. I'd rather not. Okay, well then what else are you gonna do? You're gonna go look at more homes? It's the same situation. So this is where we gotta inform you on what's happening on the market. We need to do that as early as possible so you waste less time and you can focus on the people who actually wanna participate in the market. And what you need to understand, guys, is not everyone is a candidate to buy a home in today's market. I think that's the other thing, too, is sometimes we're trying to make something happen and trying to make something work because we want to close a sale or because they're nice or we, we have a friendship or we hit it off or we build rapport. But not everyone can buy a home. And it's your job to figure out who can and who can as early as possible. Any questions, guys? Are there any questions? Yes. What if you do come to realize that there's somebody that's not ready to compete in this market, but like they don't want to say it to themselves? How would you like kind of direct them and tell them this is the right time? Like straight up Yeah. Okay. That's that's a great question. So what if you get someone who you know is probably not a candidate to buy a home, but they don't like want to admit it to themselves or they're not they don't want to accept reality. They're in denial. Right. I would have a heart to heart conversation with them. I would say, Jackie, you know what? You guys are, you're really nice. You know, you and your husband, I really want to help you guys buy a home, but I'm afraid I can't help you unless we really get in touch with what's happening in the market right now. And I would never want to waste your time or I wouldn't want to give you bad advice and then you don't get the home that you want. And then it reflects poorly on me and my team, right? So I want to make sure that we study the market. I want to make sure that we look at the comps. I want to make sure we see what's really out there and we're realistic with what it, what, what it takes to buy a home. And if we're able to do that, then I can help you a thousand percent. If we're not, then, you know, I feel like I would be doing you a disservice. Is that fair, Jackie? Okay, great. I would do that. And then I would go down the dialogue of figuring out what it is. And I would show them the reality. And I would say, hey, if we're going to start looking in this area. Or if we're going to go back out and look at homes again, or we already submitted one offer. That was a total fluke. That didn't work, okay. right? We're gonna go do this again. We need to go with a new approach and we need to go with a realistic approach, right? Otherwise, I don't know if I'm the best realtor for you. And every time I say it, I don't say it like attacking them. I say, I'm not the best realtor for you. I don't wanna do a bad job, right? Because what happens is when you start saying you, 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 psychology, what, what do people do? <laughs> they get defensive, right? Psychology 101. Hey, you're not realistic, Andre. You're not following my directions. Yeah. Right? Versus, hey, you know what? I don't know if, I, if I'm the best realtor for you, and here's why. Right? Or I don't know if I've given you clear instructions. Or I don't know if I've set realistic expectations with you, so I take full responsibility for that. So I'm saying the same thing, but I'm saying in terms of me, right? Not in terms of them. Because the moment you start going like, you, you're not listening, right? And then start butting heads and then psh, that client's gone, right? And so this is all like sales, guys. This is sales, right? You got to learn how to say what you're trying to say, but say it in a way that resonates with the client and doesn't piss them off and have them go somewhere else, right? And makes an impact. And then after that, if you've done that and they still don't want to make adjustments, then you have to cut your losses, and you got to move on, right? And you got to say, maybe we should revisit in a few months or whatever that might be. Any other questions so far? All right. Okay. Here's another good one, guys, is we have the data, right? But not everyone understands data the same way. Raise your hand if you're like a numbers person. Like if you see numbers and you can understand them and you like to look at numbers. Raise your hand. Not many, actually. There's only like two or three that raise their hand. Right? Like if I were to show you a graph and like go through the numbers and talk about days on market and list price of sales, price ratio, like if you would understand that stuff. 
right? Okay, only a couple people, right? Raise your hand if like, if someone like made it really simple for you to understand and told a story and like maybe gave an example, if you would understand it a lot easier. Most of the room raised their hand, right? Out of maybe 30 people in here. So it's important that you tailor how you present the data, right? Because if you're like just spitting numbers and they're not a numbers person, there's gonna be a disconnect, right? I always give that example. Like if you were to like start giving my dad like numbers and percentages, my dad's old school, right? He's gonna say, what the hell is that, right? He's gonna blow you off, right? Like, but if you told him a story or you gave him an example or you painted a picture for him or you had him watch a video that like showed a story, like he would get it, right? And think about it, every time you think of something in your mind, you're thinking in images, you're thinking in picture, you're th thinking in video, right? So stories are really effective. But there are a small percentage of people like your engineers, your high anal you know, analytic, analytic type people that they want the data, they want you to speak to them in terms of numbers, right? And they get it. But most people are not, right? So if the person is data driven, well, then use the data and talk in terms of data and just stick with the numbers and stuff like that. But if you know they're not data driven, you got to, they're more emotion driven, right? Then stories are going to sell. You got to speak to them in terms of stories, in terms of examples. Hey, let me give you an example. There was this one property. We listed the property for a million. We got 22 offers. Over 200 people came in and ended up selling for 1.3 million, right? There was a line out the door, right? And you even move your hand. There's a line out the door, right? You're moving your hand because you're like showing them this big line, right? Like hand movements, body gestures, right? Tonality, all that stuff is going to come into play. But if it's the analytic guy, right? You're going to say, hey, we listed this property for a million. We received 30 offers. It went for 1.3 million. That was a hundred and something percent over the asking price, right? So the list price to sales price ratio was this. And the average list price to sales price ratio in this neighborhood is this, right? And the average days on market are that, right? So now I'm getting like more numbers and more analytics and stuff like that. And there's some people that like, all right, yeah, I understand. But most people, they don't, right? And we just saw a perfect example here. And it may be also that you guys are all salespeople. So that's also why you guys like talking and emotion and stories as well, right? Because we're in a room full of salespeople. But when you go out there to just your average people, your your buyer, right? They're, they're going to be all over the place. So you got to figure out early on what type of person is this. Sometimes the husband's a data guy, right? And the wife is not. She's all more how it feels, right? This doesn't feel right. So you got to talk in terms of feel and stuff like that. You got to be able to adapt how you present the data. Questions. Has anybody, um, has anybody done this and been effective? with using stories to sell or adjusting their approach, maybe for husband or wife or anybody like that. Anybody have a quick example? Lily did it for one of our clients. Lily? Uh, yeah, he's like an engineer. Okay. And we were talking stories and he's telling, and then he uh, he showed her like the, the market, the numbers, and he was like, okay. Like he was super intrigued, like he liked what he was seeing. Yeah. Whereas when we were telling the stories, he just kind of laid back, but as soon as we showed numbers, like he was intrigued. Body, body language, right? So Lil, you had a client, you started telling him stories. He was kind of laid back. Then once you showed him numbers and graphs that he kind of really yeah. went towards the screen and got intrigued. There you go, right? So with that type of client, like you may need to continue to talk to him in terms of data and show him data, right? So that's a, that's a great example. Okay, let's see. Okay, this next thing guys is get buy-in. And all these copies of these slides will be available to you guys, but I definitely think you should take notes because notes just drive it home more, right? You'll retain more information. So getting buy-in, guys, what do I mean by getting buy-in? Who wants to guess what I mean by getting buy-in from your clients? What do I mean, Carlos? You kind of like ask like yes questions, like you get them to say yes more frequently so that eventually you ask the business with more um, than what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's definitely a part of it, right? Is you want to get buy-in early on. You want to say like, hey, if I'm able to do this for you, then we're going to write a good offer. If I'm able to find you a home that has this, this, and that, that's your criteria, then we're going to make an offer on the property, right? If this, then that, do you agree to that, right? So it's an agreement that you're establishing between them, 
like if this certain situation happens, then you are ready to move forward, right? You can't just assume someone's bought in, guys. You have to get buy-in from them, right? Mm -hmm. Right, you create a game plan early on and you got to ask questions to get buy-in, right? If we find a home that meets the following criteria, would you be ready to make a competitive offer at that point? Right, a lot of us aren't saying that. A lot of us are just kind of waiting and like, waiting for it to happen organically, right? Or like waiting for the buyer to say like, yeah, let's write an offer on this one. I love it. Instead of taking control and say, hey, this is what we're looking for. This is your budget. This is your criteria. If we meet all these three or four, whatever points, at that point, would you be ready, right? And that's before I even show you homes. But I want to know up front, like what we're trying to do, what's the game plan that we have? So we're on the same page. This way, when we do reach that point of, hey, we found the home, it's in your budget, it meets the criteria, it's in the school district you want, whatever you told me the rules were, now I know with confidence that I could push you forward because you gave me permission. We have buy-in. We're in agreement that this is what we're trying to do, right? And you can get buy-in with sellers, you can get buy-in with buyers. It's the same thing, right? If we get you at least this price on your home, then we're going to move forward with accepting an offer. Is that fair, Mr. Client? Right. But you got to get buy in, guys. You can't just assume people are bought in. You actually have to have the conversation with them and you have to make sure that they're ready to move forward when you reach that particular goal or when you achieve that particular thing. Right. So here's an example of an email that I got from one of these top agents. This agent that I got this from, uh, just FYI, last year he did 100 million in sales. He's a buyer agent on a team, one of the top buyer agents in the San Diego area. He did a hundred million in sales by himself, right? Working all mostly buyers, Silo Flex, open houses, all the, the regular buyer sources that we're getting. This is the actual email that he sends to his clients after he meets with them. Jimmy and Jennifer, per our conversation in close, please find some homes for you to review. So he creates his list or whatever, sends it to them. Click here to view the listings. Please provide me with any feedback so I can narrow down the search for you. Also below are the top five must-haves we discussed in order to make an offer on your dream home. Please reply back confirming these are the needed features you need in your next home. Number one, buying power, a uh, home under 650, four bedrooms, minimum of two or two and a half baths, yard at least 4,000 square feet, good school, score of seven plus, bonus, nice wood flooring, right? When we find the above dream home, we will be ready to discuss terms for writing a winning and favorable offer. Lastly, in the event any of these need changes, please let me know so we can discuss and revise the search. Thank you. Please do not hesitate to call me with any other questions. So he meets with them, does a great consult, establishes what the criteria is, but and also says, hey, when we do this, then we're going to write a good offer, right? If we don't find that, then I can understand why you don't want to write a good offer, right? Why you don't want to be competitive. But when I do find this and I hit all these criteria, we're going to make it happen. And he sends that to them in an email right after the consultation and gets them to reply, right? And then when they reply, yes, that is correct. That is what we're looking for. Or you know what? Yes, but also it must have this in order for us to move forward. Okay, great. Let me revise that list. So this is the list. I just want to confirm we're on the same page. So now when I'm going out showing homes and I deliver this home that has all five of these, and maybe it even has the bonus, like we're now putting pen to paper. We're now making a strong offer. We're writing an offer to win. We're not playing around. We're not lowballing because I already, we already established the rules up front, right? I'll send this email to you guys in Slack, but you can just screenshot it or copy it. But I highly suggest you implement this. And here's the other thing. Like you can also implement this into like your conversation with them on the buyer console, right? But I would follow it up with something in writing because in writing just makes it more powerful. Because when you have a buyer console and you were talking for an hour and you said all kinds of stuff, like it's easy to forget exactly what happened. But when you follow that with, with an email that just summarizes everything and they say, yes, this is it, it's a confirmation, right? It's moving them one step closer to wanting to move forward on a property and writing a winning offer. Raise your hand if you see how this could be effective by adding this into your, your arsenal, right? Very simple, guys, but very powerful because it gets the client to commit to something, right? And that's what you want. You want a series of commitments along the way until you finally get them to write the offer and move forward with, the, with winning the property. Okay, 
Next, uh, raise your hand if you've ever bought a car from a car dealership. All right, cool. Um, the car dealership approach, right? The best agents that we have seen or that we work with, um, there's going to be a point in time when you got to try to get your client to make a good offer or to come up in the price or to respond to a counter offer, right? And what happens, like Lily had a client earlier, right, where they got a counter offer for $100,000 more. And the first thing she said was, I don't know how I'm going to tell him he has to come up 100000 more. That was exactly what she said. And she's like, well, I got to set an appointment with my lender and get my lender on the line and have him go over the numbers. But I'm thinking in my head, right? Why don't you know the numbers, right? Like we should all know the numbers. I know the numbers because I have a lending background. When I first started in real estate, I did lending my first five years, right? So I know lending, I know buying, selling, I know construction because we flipped a lot of properties and bought rental properties. So for me, like I wouldn't wait to get my lender on the line. I would just know how to do the numbers really quick. And instead of saying, hey, you got to come up 100,000, I would just punch the numbers real quick and say, hey, your payment's going to go up 700 bucks a month, right? So when you ever go to a car dealership and you're trying to buy a car, do they ever tell you how much you're paying for the car? What do they do? It's always your payment, right? They have that piece of paper and they draw like a square and you have like down payment, uh, interest rate or no down payment terms and monthly payment, right? That's all they, that's all they show you. They don't show you that they marked up your car, like 20,000 dealer markup or anything like that. They just say, how much payment can you afford this way? Right. They don't say anything. They don't even tell you what the rate is, right? That they're jacking you on the rate because they make money off that, right? All they focus on is what? Payment. Because what do people care about at the end of the day? Payment, right? 99% of the people out there, they care about payment. People who are really like the average buyer you're working with, that's all they care about. Can I afford this monthly payment? Even us, right? If you were going to buy a house right now, it's like, hey, I could get this house for this payment or this house for that payment. I like that house better. It's worth a little bit more. I'd pay $100 more for that house, right? That's how we process information. So we make it harder a lot of times by going back to people and saying, hey, you got to come up in price by this dollar amount, or you got to do this by this dollar amount, when really we should be talking in terms of monthly payment, right? So if you, get, if you can get really good at just quickly giving them a rough estimate of what the payment is and talking in terms of payment and not having to wait for your lender, because the lender may not be available right there on the spot, right? Because that's how it is, right? The market moves fast. Sometimes like you're in a counter offer situation. And it's a multiple counter and you got to get back to them within half an hour and your lender may be on a console. They may not be available and you're waiting on the lender and you have no clue what the payments are. But if you know how to calculate the payment real quick and you could just break it down. Hey guys, somebody, they're asking us to come up 50,000. I know that sounds like a lot, but all that's going to do is bump your payment up, you know, a few couple hundred bucks, 300 bucks. So, so I want you guys to not focus so much on the dollar amount. I want you to focus on, can you afford $300 more? on this property, is it worth $300 more a month to you, right? So the best agents out there, guys, they know how to present the information in a way that the client will be able to tolerate, right? Payment. So pop quiz, who knows how to calculate payment really quick? $50,000 more on the price. What will my payment, how much roughly will my payment go up? Not, a lend, not someone who's a lender, who was a lender before. Someone who's just strictly an agent. So. My house had to go up 50,000 more right now. The rates are what, 6%, 7%? Where are they at? Six, is that a fair number? Okay, let's just say 7%. The interest rates right now are 7%. My payment is, I, I got a counter offer for $50,000 more and it's my house. I win the deal if I pay 50 grand more. How much will my payment go up? You got 10 seconds. 10, nine, eight, seven, six. What was the answer? 250? <laughs> 20 something bucks okay so a quick approach right remember it's not going to be exact right they want exact numbers they can get with the lender and all that right um but quick approach guys i tried doing this multiple ways on the calculator um it's about five dollars for every thousand 
right? So if it's 50,000, how many thousands is that? 50, 50 times five. 250 is roughly the interest portion only, right? That's how much interest, but then you got principal as well, right? So another calculation that I was doing earlier was multiply 50,000. What was I doing? It was an easy way. <laughs> I have a mortgage calculator. Yeah, if you have a mortgage calculator, right, that's that's the, the next best way, right? But if you just do a thousand uh five dollars for every thousand, that's gonna give you a rough figure, right? It might be a tad bit more when you add in principal, tax, and insurance, and maybe just bump it up another 50 bucks, a hundred bucks. But if you want the app, it's like 20 bucks, but it is amazing. It's called QPI. I have that app. And you pretty much like, I mean, you can't see it, but you type in lo the loan amount and then you click loan amount. So it knows, okay, that's the loan amount. And then you can do, okay, 50,000 down payment or whatever, right? Interest rate, you get 7% hit interest. And then you're going to go 30 years and get this term. So it knows. And then it just calculates yeah, it. Right there. The it's on the Chicago title okay. app. So now, now I remember the quick way that I did it. All I did was, I figured out how many thousands I had and I just multiplied it by the interest rate, right? That was the quick way. So it was 50,000, right? So if I have 50,000, right? How many thousands is that? That's 50, right? So if I just take 50 and I multiply it by seven, which is the interest rate, it's 350 bucks a month. That was the fast shortcut I was trying to figure out, remember. But really quick, right? However many thousands it is times the interest rate, it's roughly the payment, the increase in payment. So now when I'm trying to get my client to come up 50 grand on the payment, right? I'm going to say, hey, guys, you know, we got a counter offer. The great news is if you guys want to move forward with this property, your payment's probably going to go up 350 bucks or so, but you'll be able to lock into this property, right? And you're talking in terms of payment instead of talking in terms of 50,000, right? Or you're going to say the 50,000, but then you're going to quickly break it down to what that would be in payment. Because that's going to allow the client to make a decision a lot faster. Yes or no? Because if you're like, hey, 50,000, you know, that's what you got to come up and we get this property and then, okay, we want to think about it. And they're going to go back, then they're, they have no clue how to figure this stuff out, right? And then maybe you're like, well, let me get my lender on the line. Are you available to me? Are you available to do this? Let me see when the lender's available. Can I have them call you? That doesn't always work right there on the spot. Yes, you should have your lender available, but you as an agent should know the basic information to give it to them right then and there. Because now when you tell them 350 bucks a month, when they want to go think about it, they could just think about 350 bucks, right? And see if they can afford it. And that's how you're going to get them to move forward with the decision a lot faster. Now, for some of us guys, 350 bucks a month, is that a lot of money? In payment? An increase? Depends, right? But when someone's buying a million dollar home or a $2 million home and their payment's already going to be six or seven grand or whatever it might be, 350 bucks is a small fraction of their payment. So just because 350 might be a lot for you, right? If that, if your payments went up, that may not be the same for an actual client who's already trying to buy a $2 million home, right? So we don't want to think for the client. We just want to be able to give them the information as quick as possible so that they can make a decision. Questions? All right, no questions. Uh, we just did that, understanding the numbers, right? We went into that, to that. Okay, we're coming to the end, guys. Emotion-based closing questions. So when you understand the numbers, then you can ask questions to move them forward based off emotion, right? And uh, there was a, there was an example that Thomas talked about one time when he came up here and he had a client who was on the fence. And I remember, I think I remember correctly, Thomas, you told the client like, Hey, this was your dream to buy a home here in America. Right. And yeah, you're going to have to come up in price, but what sort of price tag can you put on buying a home, achieving the American dream, having your kids have their own backyard, all these different things. Right. I didn't know the I was like, like, Hey, 
six hundred dollar difference in the mortgage is worth the dream that you have your whole life. For all you got support that decision. So but if it's not, then I would encourage you to consider it. Boom. There you go. Right. So I'm going to repeat that because this is recording right now. He told the client it's going to cost you 600 bucks more a month. Right. And he said, if the $600 more a month is too expensive to achieve the dream that you're trying to accomplish, then I totally support you. Right. But if it's not, then I urge you to move forward. I definitely think you should move forward with this property. You're going to have to pay 600 bucks more, but you're going to be able to achieve your dream. And that's what you hired me for. Right to achieve the dream because you told me you wanted to buy a home. You wanted your kids to, you wanted to move out of that condo or townhouse. You wanted your own backyard. You wanted the pride of home ownership. That's going to cost you 600 bucks more a month right now. Is it worth it to you? And then you shut up, right? So what you're doing, right, is you're playing on emotions, right? Because a lot of times people forget why they even started trying to buy the home. They forget why they even went through this whole process because they get caught up in the market. They get caught up in the, the payment, the down, all those different things, right? Competing with offers and stuff like that. So you need to remember from that first initial conversation, why did you even go down this route? And you tie into the, you, you pull on the emotion strings, right? And the motivation, and you need to tie that into your closing questions, right? Because I'm not just saying, hey, come up 50 grand. I'm saying, hey, pay 350 bucks more to achieve the dream that you're trying to achieve. Is it worth 350 bucks more? And when you say it that way, then people are going to like, yeah, I guess I can pull it off, right? Yeah, it is worth my dream, right? My kids do need their own room. Especially if you know there's a need, right? Now, here's the thing. If you just know like this isn't a good deal for your client and you know they, like, they're not going to be able to afford it or they're going to put themselves in a bad situation, do not use emotion-based closing to close them and to move forward, right? We're not doing this to put, you know, do harm to people. But if you know your client is just on the fence and they're getting nervous, a lot, which a lot of people do, right? They get nervous, they get cold feet. It's all becoming real now, right? And that's usually when clients try to back out, right? They go through all this process, their offer is about to get accepted. And they're like, whoa, we need to think about it. It's happening too fast, right? But you know, they make great money. They're job secure. You, you know, Husband and wife both work in tech, right? They got a million dollars in the bank, like all those things, and they're just tripping off the $300 a month. Then, yeah, close them to move forward if you know that's the good thing for them, right? But you use these techniques to remind them of why we're going through this in the first place. And you do that. Who thinks they could do that? It takes practice, though, and it takes confidence, right? And the way you get confident is how? How do you get confident? Shoot your shot. Practice. Oh, yeah. Shoot your shot. <laughs> you shoot your shot. You just shot your shot by yeah. saying that out loud, right? But that's the thing, right? You don't get confident by just doing this one time. You get confident by practicing this over and over, role play, and in the live setting with clients to where it just comes natural, right? And you can do that on the fly. And you can say that with confidence. You can look someone in the eye and they believe you, right? They feel it. Your confidence is going to give them confidence to move forward and that it's the right thing for them to do. That's how you get people to move forward, right? Okay. So we talked about a lot of things, right? A lot of different points there. Um, I know we're coming up on time and I did want to role play this, but maybe we'll role play on another session. Um, or if any of you guys want to stick around and role play, we can role play as well. But here's the thing, guys, all of these different strategies by themselves are not going to get the job done, right? Like understanding the client profile, if you only do that, that but you're not talking payment with them, there could be a disconnect, right? All those different things, emotion-based closing, right? If you don't understand their profile and you're just trying to close this investor on his emotions, it's not going to work, right? It's all of these things put together that make the best salespeople on our team and on other teams. It's because they embody all of these things, right? They make this all part of their regimen. They study these, these things, they tweak, they add, right? They do these things on a daily basis. It's not just one of them that is gonna make you, you know, convert buyers at a higher level. You have to do all of them, right? And so it's gonna take time. Like you're not just gonna grasp this overnight, but you're gonna have to slowly start practicing this and implementing this into your 
your process, your plan. 